So if you have been a financial advisor and in the space for a while, you start to realize that a lot of trainers, coaches, or a lot of people, what they preach about in this industry to get to your MDRC, to get to your multi six vehicles, so on and so forth, has a lot to do with a particular method, right? Or one strategy, whether is it uh, referrals, whether it's social media, you know, or big cases, for example, right? But one of the things that nobody talks about is about the roadmap on how to get there, right? So because, you see, the truth here is that it has nothing to do with you know, what you really do in terms of the method, but rather the stages of the advisory business that you're in, right? And the crucial part is that most people miss out this whole entire thing of, this whole idea, entire concept of sequence, right? Because the truth is not so much about like just doing something, right? Or like applying a method. You know, it's about looking the right time and space to it, right? Otherwise, you'll never get the results even after doing it for years, right? So in this video, I created the blueprint, you know, after coaching more than 1,400 advisors with nearly 3,000 hours of like coaching in the past four years, uh, and walking the path of the advisor myself, right? So this will work for any advisor, regardless of um, companies, agencies, and even countries, because we also tested it out with people from Hong Kong, you know, people from uh, Brunei as well as Malaysia, right? So this will also explain why some methods, uh, you know, or some trainings or some courses that you, you've been to doesn't work for you, right? And in this video, I will basically review the exact blueprint and roadmap to how you get from advisory business from 0 to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50k every single month. Okay, so again, if you don't know me, my name is Benjamin and I'm the CEO of Authentic Advice Systems where we help financial advisors basically, you know, reach more people, make more impact and basically, you know, earn a lot more money while being happy, purposeful and authentic. Okay, so I made these videos because I hope that by documenting uh, the lessons, you know, what I've been through and what we've taught to other advisors as well, uh, it might really help to make more money and progress further in this career. Okay, and maybe who knows, one day you're going to work closer with us together. So enjoy this video, use it, grow advisory business and make more money and enjoy the video. I mean, you dive right in, right? For the next 90 minutes, we'll be here together on this journey. I'd love to um, share with you what are some lessons and, um, you know, they have learned and distilled down as well. Okay, so now, so here's the promise, right? So I'll share with you um, how to go from where you are right now in your business to 10, 20, 30K plus every single month, um, predictably and sustainably in the shortest, quickest possible time ever. So just a short, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, basically, I coach a lot of financial advisors, managers and directors. Um, across the years as well, right? So we have quite, most of our clients are from Singapore, but we have quite a handful from Brunei, Malaysia, as well as from Hong Kong. Yeah, so anyway, our, our company uh, is on a mission to really help FAs and leaders reach more people, impact more lives. And third one, which is more importantly, is to build that advisory, uh, ideal advisory business, right? You know, and why I say ideal advisory business, right? It's because some, a lot of times, you know, when we go for the grind for sales, production, so on and so forth, right? We end up sacrificing a lot of other things as well. Right? Uh, for example, time, non-negotiables and everything else. And you know, sometimes some of us might be earning the money, but we might not be really living that life that we really want. Right? So especially if you are parents, I know parents. Any parents here? Great. Oh, okay. Grandparents? Anyone? No? Okay, parents. Oh, okay, great. So you know, especially your kids and everything else, it's all different, right? So yeah, so this is me or this. Is it this was me? This is me? Basically, this one was like way back. Okay, I was in 2017, I was 22 years old. So I was studying for my accounting degree back then. Uh, obviously, didn't like it, right? So I did this instead. Um, turned out pretty well, had my ups and downs, but did my MDRT in seven months. Um, you know, then went up to management, and of course, you have all the career talks, so and so forth, right? Um, yeah, this, is about like, this was another training at HSBC last time. Some of you, if you guys like from Advisors Click, I think it's one of the office as well, another one from them. Uh, menu life, you know, um, GE, you know, and the next few photos are more of our own internal workshops that we do for our clients, right? So we have like masterminds. So we had like a group at the first time we did it was like about 30 plus, near 40 people, um, different advisors, different companies, agencies all coming together for two days in a nice hotel. This was done last year, another one as well, right? So this one's quite interesting. We have people who are 35 years in the business. Anyone more than 30 years in the business? All right, this is amazing. Uh. Respect. <laughs> Right? Because after you guys have been long, longer in the business, you realize that it's not so much about how much money you earn in a year, but rather how long you can sustain. Right? And as for the more senior ones, uh, you guys also realize right, that sustainability is not so much only about the money, but it's also about the purpose and whether you can do the same thing over and over again for a long period of time. Right? You know, so uh, we had like few very, very senior people here and uh, stuff like that. Right? So obviously after seven years in the industry, coach, advisors, managers, directors, of more than 30 years in the business as well, different countries, companies, agencies, um, and 1,005 unique consultation calls. So this is one of the key things that we have in the business, right? Which is every week, I've spoken to more than, when I say this number 1504, it's like 1504 
unique advisors and directors right, over the last uh, few years on a one-to-one -one basis. So this is where you really dive deep into the business, um, helping them to coach and build their business up. Right? 2,000 plus hours of coaching, you know, did right in the seven months, and uh, taking home about 240,000 at the age of 23, while you know, all being an undergrad. Right? So in short, um, basically like I mentioned, there was a quick introduction, so I'm going to share with you exact roadmap that will get you from where you are right now to where you want to be. Okay, so now, you understand, right? I know this definitely works, um, purely because we tested it within our internal roster of clients, analyzed the data from 1,000 plus, 1,500, 100 plus advisors and leaders, right? So, for example, we have people like uh, Melissa, right? Um, interesting story about her. Anyone knows her? See her before? No? Uh, some, some, some of you are you know, nodding your head, right? So, Mel was very, very interesting. So, she hopped on a call with me when she was three months in the business. Unfortunately, I had to decline her because we don't take in two new advisors. Not because new advisors got anything wrong, eh? it's just that you know, we like to deal with advisors that are a little bit more mature and senior. So she was doing a speech, she joined, and then I had to decline her. So she came back on a call with me one year later, right? And what happened was that she had already done her own MDRT at a point in time, within a few months or something, and then she hopped on a call, and the biggest problem wasn't about, you know, how can I do sales or whatever. Her biggest problem was how can she make this business sustainable, right? Because she didn't want to feel like, you know, not knowing where your next prospect is coming from. Anyone have that kind of feeling? Right, like every month, you don't know where the next prospect coming from, that kind of stuff. Right, so that's really um, like for Mel, right? And uh, just so that you guys know, I don't know if you can load, if you cannot, yeah. A very nicely packaged system that could tell me what I needed to do, what I need to do to get to where I want to be, or if I'm already at this point, what do I then need to work on? So it was like everything all in one place, rather than me having to go to different places to get information. Yeah, actually, yeah. Wow, amazing, yeah. Okay, and more importantly, I want to pump myself, like I mentioned, and uh, I love this quote. You know, a man with the experience is never at the mercy of the man of man with opinion, right? I think it's very easy to give advice, give opinion, um, but if you never walk through it, it's just kind of different, right? You know, so that's for that. Today, me running through the different stages and frameworks today will create skepticism in most, uh, confusion in some, and uh, impact a select few, right? And those are the people that we're creating this presentation for. They are, in short, right, we have to go from zero to 30, 40, 50K plus a month. In essence, right, there are five stages that we've distilled down, right? And in each of these stage, I'll share with you the situation, the main problems, what's the solution or the outcome that you want to achieve so that you can get to the next level, right? And I think this is very important because in this day and age, especially in this industry, we all have this, uh, you know, we have see the ads running, right, saying that you should do, use referrals, Right, and then say that you should do sales, do whatever, whatever, right? And I think it's scary because if you think about the problem right now in this industry, it's not that there's a lack of solutions, but there's a problem with the misdiagnosis, right? So how many of you went for courses, trainings, and programs? You all been through it, you all really worked hard, use it, but then didn't really get the kind of results that you want? Anyone? Right? So sometimes we can say, ah, I must be the trainer, lah, right? The, the coaching sucks, whatever, whatever. Sometimes, Right? It could be the effect that like, the problem is misdiagnosed. And if we misdiagnose the problem, then it doesn't matter what solution we're going to get. Make sense? Right? So what happens when you go for courses, trainings, and everything else? You get information, you get what we call um, quote-unquote value, right? but value that might not be translated into ROI. You know? Anyone feels this? We've been through it before? Yes, I see you nodding your heads. Huh? Okay, cool. So, so stage one is figuring things out. In this stage, right, your income is, your total income, right, is about 0 to 3k a month. Your main problem is acquisition. Your main outcome is you want to build sales habits. And the framework is what we call conversation and ask 100. Okay? Now, I like to make a disclaimer. It's not exactly the same as Project 100. Okay? It's conversation and ask 100. Okay? So I'll dive deep, deeper into this, right? So, um, this, okay, so this chart over here, right, goes in very deep into the metrics that will determine more or less the situation you're in. Right, so your FYC is usually less than 2K a month. Um, bar, bar stands for bonuses, allowances, if you're on scheme, let's say in G is GS, for example, right? Or recurring and recurring, right? So it's just all together. Now, you need to understand that could be a range, okay? If you are 15 years in the business and your FYC is less than 2K, I'm guessing your bar could be a lot more, <laughs> but FYC is low, right? So that's kind of a big idea, right? But your income is about 0 to 3K, your clients is about 3, 30 to 50 clients, okay? So, there are usually three groups of people that will be in this stage. Number one, either you are new, right? Now, if there's new advisors, there's also 
what advises? Oh, who say oh? <laughs> Sensitive, huh, guys. Okay, so season. Ah, okay, season, right? They're also season advisors. And then last one, most likely a student advisor. Now, the main problem in this at this stage, right, is client acquisition. And what I mean by that? Client acquisition is basically two activities. What are those two activities? Road, road show. Two activities. Prospecting, good. Next one. What's the other one? Still under prospecting, right? Someone said something? Closing, Closing. correct. Re do you realize something? Uh, in I think not only in GE, uh, I think across all companies, uh, there's no such thing as top number of appointments award. Uh. Have? Don't have, right? Because nobody cares about how many appointments you have, how many competitors you have. They only care about how much production which have to be translated into selling and closing. Make sense? So there's only two activities here, right? So the problem, right, in terms of acquisition, in terms of prospecting and selling, right, it's usually a combination, your obstacle is usually a combination of you don't know what and how to do, so you don't know the exact how to prospect kind of stuff, which is a knowledge problem. You might not know how to apply or you don't apply, right? Maybe some of the leaders here, maybe you teach everything that you know already, but then they see no results, right, purely because they might not want to apply, right? And then the third one is that you're not willing, right? Now this is, the third thing, right, is something that's a little bit more um, different from the first two. So your first two, right, is more like things that you can really do, right? Like you can really prospect, you can really do roadshows, you can really apply, apply. You can listen to lectures, whatever. The third one, right, has a lot to do with attitude. So what do I mean? If let's say you're going, let's say you're supposed to prospect, right? You go for prospecting, you go through the script, you run through the closing, but then your attitude is like, oh, I don't want to be here. I hate, I hate doing this. Right, your manager say, okay, come please, cold call night, cold calling night, or whatever, right? And then you're like, okay, you go through, but you hate it. What's going to happen is that you will get things done, you might get better, but you will not get the results because of the attitude, right? So that's really a combination of these three things, right? So depending on where you're at, you might want to um, see what you can diagnose, right? And the main outcome at this stage, right, all you have to do, right, is to learn and build sales habits. Now you start to realize that I'm not saying go and prospect more. I'm saying that learn and build sales habits, right? And the reason for that is because, think about it, the cost of reality check. Huh? Okay, what industry is this? Insurance? Any, any other? Financial. Financial? Good, what else? It's a sales industry. Agree? We, this one, we rarely, we don't have too much on like best financial planner or what, right? Or financial planning, right? Usually it's top few based on production, agree? Right, now, there's nothing to do with the company, it's just how the nature of the industry works, right? So at the end of the day, it's still a sales industry. Uh, it's a noble one. It just so happens that we're just selling insurance investments. Sometimes we also sell CPF products, <laughs> agree? CPF, IS, so on and so forth, right? So it depends on what we're selling, right? So again, at this stage, right, for those who are in this stage, it's not about attempting to be great at prospecting or great at selling. The key, right, is just to normalize the very fact that you're going to prospect and sell. So think back to where well, one of my senior advisors or so. Think back to the first time you entered the industry, right? Maybe you were from a fresh grad, you're a student advisor, maybe you were mid-career switches, right? What happens here is that you got a lot of things you need to go through, right? Prospecting, selling, all the administrative stuff, right? And then obviously the internal, you need to go through what? Rejections? Ego? Right? How many of you had this feeling right, when you first reached out for a warm market? Let me do warm. Anyone do warm market? Yeah? If I, okay, cool. How many of you, uh, when you go for a warm market, right, you're like, wow, feel like I'm begging for an appointment, uh, begging for an opportunity. Anyone? Or asking. Get a kind of feeling, right? Sometimes it happens, right? You know, and that has a lot to do with the ego, the pride, and everything else that we have. So the goal is to normalize these activities, normalize the very fact that we get rejected, normalize that when you ask someone, they will blue tick you, right? You've got to normalize that. Because at the end of the day, what we really want to build here is identity. The biggest reason why there's so much struggle when someone first joined the industry or at this stage, right, is because they cannot overcome, they cannot let go of the past identity. Maybe in the past, you were a 10 a month corporate kind of person. You switch over here, you start from ground zero. And then you have to, hey, bro, you know, uh, can I ask you for an opportunity to do Porsche review? You see, you, you have to do this kind of stuff, right? That's the hard part to, to get over, right? So you gotta let go of the identity and move on to the new one, right? So the goal is to normalize. And this is, first of all, Anyone want to make a guess what mountain is this? What? Mount Everest? No, what? First of all, I don't know what mountain is this. I just randomly got on Google. Okay? But 
The point is, if you see the guy over there, right? And uh, this, this uh, imagery is just very simple. So you think about it, right? As you are climbing up the mountain, right? You're climbing, climbing, climbing. What happens to the oxygen? It gets thinner. Do we agree it gets more difficult to breathe? Yes? At some point in time, when you climb almost to the top, right? That's where it gets very, very hard to breathe. Now, what most people do, right, is that when they start getting hard to breathe, they start to go back down, right? Okay, you know what? Hanan, very difficult to breathe. Right? But the truth here is, right, you want to stay at the top for a little bit longer and let your lungs adjust to the air. And that's where you normalize the top. Does that make sense? Right? So this is really just the imagery for that. Lah, okay? I have no idea which mountain this is. Okay? So that's that. Okay? So the solution, right? If you're at this stage, is conversion 100 plus, eh, conversation 100 plus, ask 100. Okay? Now, I'm not, you, you will not see me telling you okay, exactly how to reach out to Wong. I'm not going to go through that because at this stage, right? You just need to talk to people. I know I sound like your managers or leaders, right? Just talk to more, talk, talk more, just talk more, right? Yeah, but at this stage, that's really the case. Now, when you go to stage two and three later, it need not be the case, right? But at the start, you just want to have conversations and just ask, right? I've been through so many advisors and, and talked to them so much, right? That usually at the beginning, you shouldn't have too much of a problem with the resources they have in your agency because your leaders will most likely teach you all this already, right? But if it's not working, then it's usually the attitude thing, right? Or you don't apply. Okay, so that's usually the case, right? So you just need to talk, right? Now, some people ask, hey, but Ben, you just say go and talk to people. Don't need process, I mean, like don't need to watch the screen, yada, yada, and things like that, right? Um, the idea here is this. You think about those people who sell tissue paper, right? Do we agree, yeah? Okay, those people who sell tissue paper, but well, we see them, right? Will we identify them as salesmen or saleswomen? No? Yes or no? Some say yes. Let's touch hard, touch hard. When you see the person, the energy tissue paper, you, you straight away think the person is a salesperson? Most likely not, right? You know, because why? This person is just basically going around. I'll tell you, the people who sell tissue paper are really the ones playing the law of large numbers. Eh? Agree? Because as long as you ask, they'll, out of 100, at least will have one person buying one. For sure, right? Now, what makes a salesperson, what makes like, you having a sales skill set, right? Is that instead of one out of 100, maybe you can close one out of 10, right? Because then your efficiency, effectiveness of that matters, right? Okay, so that's that, huh? Okay, great. So now we have one screen. For those who cannot see, just see me, okay? I think I'm better than screen. Ah, okay, go back. Okay, so that's why it is, right? So because they have volume, right? So you might need to grind out a bit at the start with my student advisors. Ah, okay. Okay, now this is a very important quote that uh, I want to quote myself, lah, okay, but I'm going to put myself there, right? Uh, but don't allow your preferences to be a limitation. Now, what do I mean by that? So, how many of you, how many of us do we have we on a day to day basis? We say that actually, you all do roadshow, I don't feel like doing, I don't prefer to do, I'd rather do XYZ. Yes? Right? And what happens here is that when you allow your, sometimes we, it's not wrong to prefer or choose something, it's just that sometimes we go to the extent that our preferences, are also the same reasons why we are not progressing forward, right? Who here prefers to prospect every day? No? Oh, yeah, see, we got a problem, right? Like, go and talk to people, you know, make sure you get your sales in. Wow, you run those kind, ah, yeah, yeah. This, this, kind, this kind is usually passive inquiries, right? Yeah, right, so, so those guys, you see, even for passive inquiries to happen, you must first do something. Right? If let's say passive inquiry for social media, you need to post content. Agree? If you want to get passive referral from existing clients, you need to keep in contact and build relationships. So it's still activity, agree? Right? So most of us don't prefer prospecting. We do it just because it's part and parcel of the industry. Right? But imagine I say, hey, let's say Tian, hey, Tian, I don't prefer to prospect. Then how? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? So don't allow your preference to be limitations. Okay? So um, the formula here, for if I want to elaborate a bit, is just volume, skills, and output. Okay? Now, what we want, right, is output. At this stage, you've got no skills. Not as much. Huh? So you need to put in the volume, which is frequency and effort. Right? That's the easy part. Okay? So, next question I usually have when I say this, right, is that, but Ben, why you like only talk about prospecting and sales? What happened to financial planning? Huh? Don't you plan nice, nice for your client, man? 101 Excel sheets. CFP, Ghost Mapper, THFC, AEPP, whatever. <laughs> Don't need me. Who here got all those kind of certs? At least CHFC, you know, CFP have, have, right? Okay. This one, controversial question. 
How many of you, after taking the cert, uh, you should wait more money in the next few months? <laughs> you hear the after the answer for you, right? Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to take those things, right? But I think there's always time and place for everything. So sequencing is something that is very important. Make sense? Right? So at this stage, right, when you first, what everybody needs to do, just like Maslow hierarchy of needs, there's this thing, quote me, ah, uh, bad, right? It's called financial advisory hierarchy of identity. So number one, everybody needs to be a salesperson first. New prospect, a new self. After you become a salesperson, the next identity you want to adopt, then you become an advisor. And the advisor do what? Plan, recommend, advise lah, right? Then this is where, but Ben, I see my senior seasoned advisors, right? They're 15 years old. They like do planning, then sure we can close case one day. You need to understand, they've got 15 years of prospecting and sales skills ready, right? You know, so you got to play like sequence, right? So you must always be a salesperson first, then a financial advisor. Then the last one, of course, then you'll be a coach, lah. Right, you know, financial coaching and everything else, right? So what's the difference between coach and advisor? Advisor, you plan, recommend, whatever, right? Coach is really more like, you sit down with the person and then say like, hey, um, the person say, oh, you know what? I want to go for this landed house at 65 years old. Then the coach will be like, okay, is there a reason why you want this landed? Have you ever considered you know, and then you start questioning your life, right? This kind of coach, right? So usually, nobody really go there, um, but this is the first two, right? So coach, guide, train. Uh, technically speaking, uh, if you're a manager, director, technically you're kind of doing the coaching in that, in that sense. Not really coaching them about life, but like prospecting and stuff, okay? So that's that. Now, now I want to talk about two, two mistakes here. Uh, big mistakes I've seen across people at this stage. Number one, fear of judgment. Okay, this is really not a big one, right? And the reason... Why we fear that so much is because we always want to be in that comfort zone where people validate us. And when we get out of that, people will first try to cast stones at you. No, actually, before that, they'll say that, hey boy, uh, you should you join the industry or not? Or you don't, uh, you know, you should do this job, yada yada. Once you step out, wah, then they start being angry at you. Wah, don't listen to me, uh, blah, 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 right? Maybe your spouse may not have support. But once you start winning and become successful, well, then they cheer for you. Hey, MDRTA, good job. You know, that kind of stuff, right? That's usually how the cycle is like. But we must first understand that like, sometimes people will always cast stones because they want you to lose. Because it helps them justify the risk that they dare not take. Right? And this is really the truth, right? So, fear of judgment. That's one. Now, second one, indecisiveness. This is the big problem. Actually, not even... Yeah, actually, this is a big problem, especially stage one, which is what? Think about if you're a new advisor, you join. Okay, la, try, try, la, right? Ask a few people, try to do some things, right? Then after that, like, see how long, okay, why are you in this, like, see how long, see how it goes, right? And then what's going to happen, right? When someone has this mindset of see how long, you can be sure uh, their results also see how long. Agree? Their clients, whether to buy from them or not, will also see how long. That's usually the way it is, right? Because the truth is, if you're not decided that you want to make this industry work, or make your time here worthwhile, you will never get there. So it goes back to a decision, right? And we've been through that before. Even who here came through internships? Anyone? I have, huh? Okay, cool. Now, if you are a student advisor internship or whatever it is at this point in time, right? It's not necessary that oh, this is going to be a career for life. But rather, right, you want to give yourself that six months and one year, right, to give all your best to make sure that you really try and do your best. Because if you didn't do your best for that one year, how could you really say that this career is not for you? Right? So this is, goes back to decisiveness, right? So stage two. Now this one, your eyes need to open big, big. Ear also need to open big, big. I don't know what. This is important because most people lies in this stage. Right? Most. Uh, okay? So stage two, right? Your income is around 3 to 8K. Right? So your main problem is CPR. CPR basically means certainty, predictability, and reliability, right? In terms of the main acquisition. I'll talk more later, right? Main outcome is to streamline your sales and the framework is called one times one times one. Okay, so this is where, right, your FYC is two to five K a month, plus minus. Your bonuses, allowances, is recurring bar is about one to three K, depending on how many years in the business. Uh, income is three to eight K, clients about 80 to 150. That's more or less the range, right? Now, like I said, bar of advisors at this stage, um, at this point in time, you kind of like, remember you go through stage one already, you kind of know how to prospect, kind of know how to sell, Right, but it's still all over the place, right? And you try to try to experiment. Do cold call first. Cold call don't work, do warm. Warm don't work, do lead gen. Lead gen don't work, do roadshow. Then after that, hey, screw this, lah. let me do referrals. Right, then the prospect don't give referral. 
then you also sucked up, right? So you're just trying a lot of things, right? Go for courses, workshops, programs, to see what suits. Um, yeah, some of you will achieve MDRT at this stage already, right? Um, you probably wouldn't if based on last time, but now you do because like it's discounted or something. So that's kind of like the stage. The problem, right? I have advisors come on the call, right? Already MDRT. And then I ask like, okay, so what help do you need, right? And then they're like, well, I don't want to feel like I got lucky. Right? Because their first couple of years is just grinding up, trying to get MDRT, right? Then next year you also don't know, they don't know like exactly how to replicate the success. So it's usually the case. Um, this is where you obviously where keep thinking where your next prospect is coming from. Right? So you see the difference, huh? Stage one is I don't dare to talk to people. I got a lot of people, but I don't dare to talk to them. Stage two is I talk finish already. Then what's next? You realize? So that's usually kind of like the route. Okay, now main problem is lacking CPR which is basically consistent, predictable, and reliable. Now, this is one of the most important things that you can ever pay attention to and care about if you really want to get past the MDRT or like reaching MDRT to begin with, right? So the problem right now, right, is that I want you to imagine you've got a lot of methods, right, because you're trying out. And then what happens here is that every single bit of those methods will give you a bit of results, right? Refro will give you a bit. Warm also give you a bit. You do social media, who do social media, post some content, also get a bit. Everything kind of get a bit, right? So that's the problem, because when everything is a little bit, right, you're splitting your attention and time across all to three to four different, five different methods. And when you do that, you, do, you are able to master the skill sets, right, of one particular method. Then your commission look like this. Huh? So your main outcome at this stage, all you need to do is to streamline your sales. Streamline your sales. Let me explain what I mean by streamline your sales. The framework to use, right, is what I call one times one times one. This framework, across all the advisors that hit six figures in less than 12 months, right, all use this framework. Okay, let me explain what does one times one times one means. What it means is that you only need one prospecting method, one opening process, and one closing. Period. So let me explain or illustrate how that means or what it means. Imagine you have an advisor. This person, right, one method is what? Just call, buy this cold calling every day. Maybe the angle is ILP, cash, U, GWA, whatever. Right? That's the angle. One opening process. Whether they do it, first appointment, two appointments, whatever. Usual, right? Report agenda, fact find. Find a problem, pain, contact presentation, so on and so forth. Then, maybe two appointment close. Then the second appointment is closing. Right? You take out your BI, your peeps, whatever. And then, obviously, you've got product pitch, right? So, that's all this person needs. Really. That's all. That's all. Some people, right, the problem is, right, they might have one, the prospecting method, they might have a few, right? They might first do roadshow plus cold call, you know? And then the logic becomes, roadshow not every week or every day, man. so I've got spare time, right, so I should do cold call, correct? Why don't you just do cold call? Right, because roadshow, in this case, right, it's not CPR, right, certain, it's not predictable, it's not reliable, because it's not, it's not as consistent as well, right? So that's that. Now, opening, who here got concept presentation? Does your concept presentation? Yes? Yes, right? Okay, good. How many content presentations you have? Who here only got one content presentation? Two? Uh, seven, no. Three? Three? Okay, more than four content presentations that you have one. Up your sleeve. Okay. Uh, now, don't need to say that. Okay, but... Sometimes, we go for too many Dr. Sanjay Tulani's <laughs> workshop. We got so many content presentations, right? 28,000, Revo of Life, whatever. How I know, trust me, as an advisor, I sell one one. Every conference he have, I sure go one. Right? Buy all his books. See the same book, buy again. Right? Because he say, give to your friends. <laughs> right? And give to prospect, whatever. So I keep doing that, right? And what happens here is that, does his presentation work 100%? Because I use it and close before. Right? The problem here is that, again, when you have one presentation that your manager teaches you, you have 28,000, you have this and that, right? What's going to happen is that when you're going for this appointment, you start thinking to yourself, well, this prospect, this profile, Maybe you should use 28,000. And maybe my manager one teach better. They start thinking which one to use. Then you know what happened? You try to combine. Anyone combine presentation before? F? Ah, I try to combine, right? Yeah. Guys, this one not cooking. Eh. You know, you, you don't mix curry with. I try to think of something. Eh. You, 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 okay, you don't, you don't mix curry with rabita eh, and then call it fusion. Eh. Sometimes fusion doesn't turn out well. Makes sense or not? Right? So, like, you gotta make sure you only have one, one, one. Right? Now, for more, my more seasoned advisors, you guys can have more, not a problem, because you guys have been through that before, right? But if you're at stage two, this is what you need, right? Closing the same thing. When I say one closing process, right, what I mean by that is that PA, SHIELD, right? Life, life term, or IRPs, whatever, right? 
You just have one way of pitching it. That's it. Just have one way of pitching it. Right? You don't try to have like three different features for one GLA or GWA. Right? It will just confuse the hell out of you. Right? So that's that. Okay, so you just need to have one times one times one. Period. Keep things simple. Right? So, like I mentioned, across all the advisors who went from zero to six figure income in less than 12 months, all of them apply this. All. Without exception. Even one of our clients from Brunei also, exactly the same thing. Right? So you just need to apply one times one times one. Now, but in short, right, this is why I said just now. You lead gen, co call, pre frame, set appointment, opening, closing, close, never close, follow up. That's the process that you just want to lay out and just follow, right, and improve on it. Right? You don't have a ton of different ones. Okay? Now, which, now you see, uh, at this stage in time, right, you probably have a lot of methods, a lot of presentation. Then the question becomes how to choose. Anyone? How to choose? How do you know which one is best? Two things. First is effectiveness. Number two, if you say that, hey Ben, I, all my manager, all Sanjay teach are all effective. Then the second question is, do you enjoy? Right? Because roadshow, here's one thing that I realized, and it could be worth taking this down, right? Which is all prospecting method works. All prospecting methods work. 100 percent Who here got friends or colleagues do roadshow, got do MDRT on? Eh? Cold call also got do and do two MDRT also. Warm also. Overseas market, which method don't work? Last time people do door knock also work. So which method don't work? That's the, that's the other question. Huh? Let's op ask opposite. Lah. Which question don't work? Everything works. Huh? Then, but then if you try everything and it's not working, then the problem lies with who? With what? The uh, problem lies with you, lah, unfortunately. <laughs> right? So that's the whole point, right? You know, so that's that. Okay, now, next question people will have is, must it really be one method? That's the next question, right? Usually what I suggest is you can have 80-20 of one method, so 80% of the time, let's say you do cold college and you just focus on that. The other 20%, I usually will pair up a method that is more longer term in nature, or a method that I want to translate towards to. What do I mean? I'll give you a classic example. You do cold call, okay, let's use cold call. Cold call, Ben and G already? Or, not? No. Or, or kind of can call but cannot hire people to call. How I know, I also don't know, okay, but anyways. Right, so basically, uh, let's say I'm doing cold call, or whatever it is, I cannot be calling at 9 p.m. or so, right? But I'm hardworking, so I've got time. At night, I will, what I'll do, I'll do social media, right? Do some content here and there. Because content, everybody, who here post content, right? Uh? Eh? No, 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 okay, cool. Ah, have, uh? okay, cool. If you post content, right, who here agrees that you don't get a passive inquiry straight away, right? You don't, right? Maybe take one month, two, three, four, five. If you do it well, maybe four to six months, then you start getting passive inquiries coming in. What does passive inquiry sounds like? A hey banner. I saw your post on this. Would like to find out more about insurance. Ah, that kind of passive inquiry? Yeah, that's the kind of that you're looking at, right? So I'll do 80% cold call, at night then I'll do social media content, right? Because of one reason and one reason only. Who here would like to cold call for 15 years? No? No? I mean, if you're doing it, it's doing it, but who likes to do that? Nobody. So at some point in time, do we agree we need to transit out? But if we drop cold call, then where's our source of income? That's the question, right? So this, think of it this way. You work eight to five at a corporate job, then your night time is a side hustle thing. You don't get passive income, same idea, right? So I'll do cold call, and then I'll do like content at side, right? Um, so that's usually how I'll do it. Or sometimes some people want to do cold call, they also do warm at night, right? Because they don't want to do cold call, but cold call is merely a stepping stone. Right, for them to earn some money, which is needed. Okay, so, and again, going back to 80-20, why do I emphasize on this so much? Because you think about it, right? All the shapes over here, don't ask me why is it those shapes. You're just random. I'll just Google and take out whatever diagram they have, right? But basically, you're, you have what? Meetings, correct? Trainings, prospecting, presentation, closing, product, appointments, clients. All these things you do one, correct? Every day? Then your meetings, how many meetings? Right? Agency, team, manager, peers, project, outing, Gapa. Right? And then guess what? Trainings, you've got so many things. Uh. Right? Product training, platform training. Who likes to do R and R? And ethics. You know the MCQ? I don't know if it's still MCQ. Uh. Right? You see, you still need to go through that, right? Now uh, sometimes maybe you all go for what? Estate planning, DISC, and then whatever. Prospecting also got a lot. Pros presentation also a lot. Closing. Assume close, secondary close, three option close, big picture close, brief framing close, ABC close, underwriting close. Right? Then you got product, so many different products. Now got what? Um, 
index, UL, yes, something like that, right? Yeah, so you got so many things, right? And then you got so many clients, A, B, C, D, E, F. I don't know why you keep F clients, right? But I'm guessing it's either they are often or they bought something that, like a PA plan, right? That's usually the case. So you got so many things, agree? Can you imagine how you handle this? And we have not even talked about what? Your personal life. This is just business. So it's a lot to handle. So what happens is your time attention becomes like this. And what you really want is to be all directed towards one goal, right? Which is one times one times one. This is what it means to be doing less is more. Make sense? Okay? So that's that. Okay? Now, mistakes over here. Oh, this one. Dangerous. Well, this one I had to even do a YouTube video on this, you know? Because it's so dangerous. It's called shiny object syndrome. Shiny object syndrome. Okay? Now, because when you're at this stage of like earning okay money, maybe 3 4k a month, yada yada, right? The belief in the head is the more I have, the more results I get. If I do warm, give me 2k FYC a month. If I do cold, give me another 2k. If I do reference, give me another 2k, I should do all three. That's the mindset, right? And what happens is that, of course, like I said, you see a lot of ads and everything else, then you click, right? Click, 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 and then like end up buying a course, whatever it is. Anyone see my ads before? Recently, you got see the one, the run running one. Guys, I tell you, that one was. You'll never see it. Okay, okay, never mind. You follow my Instagram, later the ads will retarget you. Okay? Well, that one was a tiring one because of the treadmill running. You know? Yeah, okay. But, anyways, that's that. Huh? So, Shiny Object Syndrome, right? So, focus. Because if, remember, at the end of the day, and this is something that is so profound, so simple, but yet so, have so much profound impact on my life, right? Which is this. Who here have goals in your life? Like G O A L, goals. Eh? Money, family, have, right? You understand this. If I give five minutes of my time or 10 minutes of my time and attention to something else that's not serving me towards my goal, what I'm essentially doing is that my goal that's supposed to reach at 40 years old is now 40 years old and 10 minutes later. That makes sense? Like it's 10 minutes later. So for every one minute you give to something else, we are pushing back our goals if it's not serving us. So it's like, you look like this. Huh? Okay, again, I googled it, so don't ask me where I got it from. Okay, but yeah, so that's that. Okay, now, so you have people like Patrick, right? So, interesting case study, very funny. Same, he was the, he's the guy doing the lead gen, cold call, angle from Cashew, or something like that. Then after that, you know, try to do it, right? So he was earning quite decent, three to four K FYC a month, right? So he was kind of okay, um, but what happened was that he got shiny object syndrome. He started doing a lot of different things. Until one day he called on a call with me, then I had to scold him. Okay? And that's why he didn't like me at the front. Okay, but I had to scold him a bit. Then after that, he came in and then within three months he did 32 KFYC and 2 run KFYC. And all we did, all we did was just one times one times one. We didn't change the lead gen co call side because it's predictable, because you just buy it and call. Man. What we changed was the sales process. How he opened, how he closed. 32 KFYC in three months. So it's 10K a month, right? From 4K a month to 10K. Just working on that. Right, because that's where the bottleneck is, right? So, I think if you're talking about production wise, I think about maybe close to 200 plus K in the span of this 1.5 years. Yeah, 200 K FIC. I feel great, definitely. Like, you know, money is everything like, sometimes. Like. But I feel like, you know, um, money comes in, but my priority is always to help and value add clients. Of course, we have to sacrifice something for like things that you want to invest. So, of course, I do pay like, you know, a, a, a amount of money to invest on myself. But in the end, the return was so much way more. And not only it gives me monetary benefits, but it also builds me to be a stronger person and also knowing the fact that I can value at my clients rather than just product selling. I would say no regrets. At first, I was so dubious, like, you know, like this guy, you know, this band scammer and all. Like, come on the call, just say, like, talk, talk, talk. Because, you know, with COVID happening, it's just Zoom. So it's kind of skeptical. Basically, uh, he, came on the, he came on the call and then he basically, I go on the call, I talk, right? Then he just think I'm some scammer. Like. Right? Because I talk, 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 sounds very good, you know? Yeah, that's basically that. But here, here you see with us, right? So that's really kind of that, right? If you go to stage two. Okay? All good so far? We are at stage two. Right? Stage four and five is a little bit easier, but stage two and three is the meaty part of things, right? Because most people are there. So, stage three. Your income is about eight to ten K. Main problem is efficiency and effectiveness. Your main outcome that you want to do in this stage is to build processes and systems, and framework is called MTI, right? This is where your FYC, aga, aga, five to seven K FYC a month. Right? Your bonuses, allowances, and recurring could be anywhere from two to three. It could be even more, depending on how many years you're in the business. Right? Income is 7 to 10K. Your clients, usually around 180 to 200. 
uh, excluding orphan clients, uh, by the way, excluding orphan clients. So the self-acquired ones is about there. So, situation. Again, you kind of been through the one times one times one, right? How many, how many of you actually got the one times one times one in the, in the past? Like you kind of get the flow, right? This is how you prospect, this is how you close, this is how you, you know, it becomes a rhythm, right? Yeah, that's what it means by one times one times one, right? So you really kind of know that. Most likely you should be MDRT already, depending on standards. Take home maybe six figures a year. Now, problem is this. But you're working long hours, or your breakthrough is capped, right? Now, if you are 10, 15 years in business, most likely that's not the case. But if you are like first few years coming up and rising, right, that's usually a problem. Your calendar's packed on. Like 20 appointments a week, you pack back to back. Then sometimes you want to, what do you call it, double book your own calendar, right? You know, some, just in case someone cancel, that kind of stuff, right? So that's that, right? Uh, main problem, like I mentioned, is low effectiveness and low efficiency in the entire business, right? Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, so. Let's talk about effectiveness first. So effectiveness is the degree to which something is successful in producing a desired result. In short, from in our context in this industry, I just call it output, right? If I go for 10 appointments, okay, how many can I close? If I can close seven, that's good output, right? If I close one, then it's not good, so it's not effective, right? The second one is efficiency, which is the quality of achieving a largest amount of useful work using as little energy, fuel, and effort. In short, inputs, make sense? So efficient means uh, you go for appointment, 10 minutes, close one. Yes? Yeah, efficient as compared to three hours, right? Effectiveness is like, instead of doing closing 10%, you close at 50%. That's effectiveness. Now, something can be effective but need not be efficient. Let me explain what it means. You can close at 50%, let's say your closing ratio for coal is 50%. But then, you take three appointments, and each appointment is three hours each. You realize it's effective, but it's not efficient, right? And vice versa. So what you want to do is to do things better, and better is just, you know, this effectiveness times efficiency kind of thing, right? So when you do this, you buy back time and you gain leverage. I'll show you some benchmark that I've seen across the industry for coal and wall. Would that be helpful? So you kind of know where you guys are at, huh? Okay, good. So let's talk about coal market, specifically coal calls. If you, whether is it random coal calls or buy this kind of coal call, buy this plus call, your show up rate, industry benchmark, 50%. So every 10 appointment you set, uh, or your tenant marketer set, right? Only five will show up. The other five will fly plane. What you want to do, bring to 70 to 80%, right? And that's really, you know, you send pre-framing and everything else, but that's usually the case, right? Uh, closing ratio for coal, anyone want to make a guess? If you do coal call lead gen, anyone been there before? What's the closing ratio on average? Say again? Anyone? 10, 20, 20, no? Less than, less than that now, okay. Yeah. You do warm or cold, usually? Do cold, yeah. Right, so for cold, right, average, you want to be about 20 to 25% average, right? If you can do that, you can do 20% is you're considered okay, right? So that's kind of a big idea. Now, if you do warm, depending on how big the case size, right? You know, that's also another factor. But if you do warm, back then when I do warm, like 70%, 80% closing, Regardless of case size, or whether it's a 10K, whatever, whatever, like average is about 70-80%, right? So you can get to that if you want to. But most, from what I've seen from our own clients before they join, probably about 40%, 30-40%, this more or less the range, right? So that's that, okay? Don't ask me about roadshows, because I only did a roadshow once for my team last time. It was a three-day thing at Expo. Anyone been to Expo? No? What that? Baby Fair. I tell you, the only thing I remember from Baby Fair was the Burger King nuggets, because I was so hungry. Yeah, that was like three days, you know, that was there, right? So there's like road shows, I don't know. Um, but road shows, the more effective way to do road shows, the always what? Always get a person to sit down, try to close, right? The new way that's way more effective that we've uncovered, right, is you get a person to sit down, do some concept or whatever it is, then you set the next appointment for that. Right? That's the more uh, effective way that we realized in the last uh, few months, right? So that's that. Efficiency factors. Number of appointments, yeah, you know. If, who here do more than five appointment close and your premium case size is not even like huge? <laughs> like not even 100K kind, no? Okay, no, ah, okay, good, ah. okay, ah. okay, duration, take it out, someone duration appointment. Now, I want to share a story. So, I, I know this advisor, uh, he was a friend of mine and everything else. So, here's what happened. Just joined the industry, okay? Six months in the business. And then, she was like, is it, is it she, all right? Then after that, she was like, okay, going for appointment with a cold prospect. Went for the first appointment, it was at 2 p.m. in the afternoon at, what's the mall at Bukit Batok there? Ah, Westmore, Westmore, right? Yeah, Westmore. She was there at Westmore. 
sat down cold, right? Uh, I think the angle back then was shield or something like that, right? So she tried to do it, whatever, right? You know what happened? That appointment, right, took about two hours. And I'm like, wow, so long. Right? I mean, two hours is relatively long, right? Then after that, at the end, when she talked to me and everything else, what happened was that uh, she was saying she was building rapport. So I thought two hours, she'd be able to close, right? Never close. Huh? Then I say, so it was four o'clock already. Huh? I say, so what happened? I'm just like, oh, she got to go by meeting her for dinner at 7 p.m. The same day. Eh? Then I was like, wow, maybe, like, maybe we can close. Huh? You know, young advisor, right? So don't want to burst the bubble. Okay, okay, go, go, go. 7 p.m. meet for dinner. The next time she texted me, uh, it was 1 a.m. Because I keep texting, like, what's going on? Right, like, and then reply, or whatever, you know, kind of kidnap or something, like, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Hey, hey, all the ladies, you know, sometimes you will see some pervert, right, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So after she, she just replied me at 1 a.m. I said, hey, what happened? And she said, oh, I just ended. I said, your appointment's so long. Uh. You know, she, make a guess what was she doing, other than building rapport. Huh? Chit chat, there's dinner, right? Okay, cool. Anything else? Hey, she watched show. She watched movie with the prospect. I'm not. This is true story. I'm not kidding you. This, she was like, oh, cause the prospect, you know, she very nice. She mid forties, you know, she very nice. Whatever. She asked him to watch movie. In the book. I'm like, okay, never mind. Never mind. Important question is, got close or not, right? That's the important question, correct or not? <laughs> got close or not, right? I mean, you see, if you got close, maybe you shield maybe two hundred bucks plus minus. You get popcorn, movie, and dinner. Okay, what? Right, good deal for a new advisor. She said, never. And I said, what's the objection? She said, let me think about it. Yeah. Anyway, until today, five years later, she probably never closed that one because I never hear anything already. So that's basically that, right? Now, agree, not efficient, <laughs> right? Yeah, some of you laugh, but some of us have been through that before. Agree. Talk to prospect three hour one. And it's not even a catch-up appointment. Eh. It's an opening appointment by talk for three hours. Huh? Okay, after a while, you're like, hey, this is not a good use of my time. Agree? Right? I mean, three hours, if you are charging on an hourly rate, it makes sense. You know, but we are not. Right? G doesn't pay your $300 an hour, right? If $300 an hour, we all agree, you probably sit down five hours a day. Talk, talk, talk. Right? Thousand five, then every hour, uh, good money, right? Yeah, you wish. Okay? You all do your sales. Okay? So, may not come like I mentioned, the build processes and systems. Okay, so this is, okay, uh, serious now, uh, so that's that. Uh. Now, here's the thing, if you don't track, you don't measure, you don't measure, you can't manage, if you can't manage, you can't control, if you can't control, you can't improve, and if you can't improve, you lose money. So think of it this way, if your closing is 30%, you meet 10 people, you close 3. By right, you could have closed 6. This means that you're losing out of these 3 every single time, for every single 10 people, right? So you're actually losing money. Now, just a show of hands, who would like to track? Their numbers, not the FYC numbers, not the login to see the portal and then uh, no, but like your calling tracker, anything, anybody likes? No, no, nobody likes, right? Nobody likes admin, admin work, right? It's funny. I had this director telling me that I say, hey, how you, how you giving your support to your team? Oh, my team just asked me to hire PA so we can track everything for them. And I'm like, okay, cool, you know, uh, good, good support, uh, All the say you don't like, uh, okay, good support. Okay, so that's that. I think someone said this. Let me think. Is it James Clear? Atomic Habits? I think I was saying like, you do not rise to a level of goals, you fall to a level of systems, right? Now, that's James Clear said the first two statements. I say the third one, okay? Which is, you build processes and systems to uncover what is working and what is not working. Now, a lot of people think that, oh, build process and system, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. No, it's ready to check what's working and not working. Because when you go for appointments, right, if you go by fields, what happens is, this appointment, uh, say like this, next appointment, you change different. Then how do you know what's really working or not? Right? You don't know. You know, so that's that. Okay, so what is system? Very simple. I'm not going to dive deep into this because I also not very that enthusiastic about systems, but it's important. So system is just basically inputs, processes, outputs, and then the output will give feedback. So inputs, although like you do the cold call, you run through the script, then you do one appointment, two appointment close, right? Then got close or don't close. If you never close, feedback lah, right? What went wrong? If got close, then of course better. Okay, so there's only two types of systems you want to look at: client acquisition and client fulfillment. Right, so it's lead generation, lead nurturing, closing, onboarding, and then delivery. Okay, so um, for those who are doing warm market, you don't need to quote unquote generate more leads. The problem with warm market, right, is not that you don't have enough of, uh, enough warm prospects. The problem is that you don't know how to nurture them. That makes sense. So what I mean by this is very simple. Remember, we first started Project One Hundred, so you reach out to all your people, right? Let's say hundred people, twenty will meet you, ten will buy, confirm will buy. Right? 
because they buddy buddy. Once you reach out to people the last 5, 10, 15 years, never talk to kind, you use the same approach, it's kind of hard. Right? So that's where the problem is. So you actually have leads, you just don't know how to approach them or don't know how to nurture them. Then usually, you know what happens? Once war market, quote unquote, dry up, then what do we do? There's only two paths. Either you do coal or you ask for referral. That's usually the way, right? Which is a whole different problem altogether, right? But that's kind of a big idea, okay? But anyways, so you want to apply the MTI framework, okay? This is a solution. So if you are already at this stage, step number one, please map out your process, okay? Number two, track the results. Number three, identify bottleneck, okay? So now at this stage, you guys are thinking, wow, man, I hate all these things. Uh. Oh, I cannot. Uh. Well, you can either ask your director to do, or you can uh, ask us to do, right? But anyways, these are the MTI framework, right? So map process will look something like this. So this is what I do for our own clients when we map out the entire system of opening, closing, right? Even the opening, do you fact find? When do you fact find? If they fact find wrongly, then what do you do next, so on and so forth. Okay, some of you might not see, but don't worry about it. I'll give you guys a copy of that, right? So that's that, right? Another one. Like, for example, asking for referrals. When do you ask for referrals? What kind of referrals do you ask? Right? Because you, you need to understand, right? When, who asks for referrals one? as a method? Yes? Some of you, okay, cool. Now, if you do referral asking, depending on which appointment you ask, the way you ask is different. And why they give is so different. Let's say it's a two appointment close. Opening, closing, then become client, okay? Let's say that's the phrase, huh? If you do opening appointment, you ask for referrals, People will give you the referrals because of the value that they had in that same appointment, not because of the product they buy. If you ask during after you close, you know after close when you ask, you are asked, they will give because they felt like the solution whatever impacted their lives, whatever, right? Now when the third one is once they become clients, right? You ask them for referrals. Who here go back to existing clients, makan halfway, take out feedback form? Anyone? No? Because that doesn't work as much for existing clients. Because existing clients, the reason why they refer is because of the depth of relationship more than the work that you do. So if you think back to your clients, right, the people who usually give you passive referrals, the one that kind of like, hey, you keep referring one, are usually people that quite like you and kind of closer together, right? So a lot of people think that when you ask for referrals, is oh, I must be a professional advisor, right? Do policy review, do whatever, take out ghost method, right? Now that's important, but the relationship is the reason why people refer. So again, going back to your processes, you need to know exactly what's working and what's not working, right? Now, I'll show you guys a real example. Once we go through this, you'll know exactly how it makes you more money. First, you run the ads, correct? You call a marketer. Hey, marketer, can I buy leads or not? So either you buy leads or they charge you 6,000 for setup fee, then what, retainer, something like that, right? I know because most of the marketers that you know in this industry are usually my friends or acquaintance. Okay, so that's usually what they do, right? Then they'll send to a lead form. You know what's the lead form? Lead form is, you know, the Facebook ad come out, right? You swipe. Then straight away, your details fill in already. Those kind. It's a very simple form. Right? Ah, that's the lead form. Lead form already, guess what? You get the lead, you text or call them, right? Call them, set appointment, then first appointment, second appointment, close, then become clients. Okay, that's usually kind of like, if you remember the process. Okay, now. This one, everybody can, ah. Huh? Next. Whatever I'm going to show you in red are the metrics that we need to track, okay? So, if you guys are wondering what is CPL, CTR, CPM, whatever, right? This one, don't need worry. This one is your marketer's job. CPL, some of you might know, it's called cost per lead. So, you know, if you spend $1,000, you get 50 leads. One lead is $20, uh, right? So, it's called the cost per lead. So, we have to track that. Then, second is what I call lead quality. Now, lead quality is usually a problem with marketers running ads because what I get and I hear from other people, right, is that they buy the leads or they run the ads, right? They get the lead, and I say, hello, is this whatever? Then some, some Indian Bangladeshi construction worker reply. That's, that's some of like the, the reason of what happens. Ah, some of you laugh because you know that's true, right? right? And that's the case, right? So that's usually a lead quality problem. Now, I'm not saying you cannot sell them. I'm just saying that like, it's, it's not a market that you're looking for, right? Then after that, you want to check show up rate. Are they showing up for your first appointment? Are they showing up for your second appointment? Closing ratio? and then your case size. The red color ones are the ones that we, in our own business, when we coach our clients, right? this is exactly what we track, right? Because, remember what I said just now? If you can track, means you can measure. If you can measure, means you can improve, correct? So this, here's the improvement part. If I want to improve on my cost per lead, so let's say each lead, each name I get uh, is $100, that's expensive, correct? So what can I do? I need to change the angle and creative, right? 
So for example, let's say, because I run ads myself, right? So the one that I do running, I don't know if you guys saw it, like, okay, go and see. I'm running on the treadmill or whatever, right? Yeah, that one decreased our cost per lead, right? So that's one thing. Now, this one you cannot control because your market is not doing it. So go and find him or her, right? So that's number one. Number two, okay, lead, lead form, uh, I skip that, right? Because the lead quality is uh, very hard for you to control. The only time you can to have better quality leads is you need to do the complicated website thingy, you know what I mean? They opt in, then they go to another page, then the page got video, apply for something, you know that kind of complicated one? That's the only way you can increase your lead quality. But they're not expensive. I have a friend, uh, very well known in the industry, like in the marketing industry, right? He charges 100, for advisors and leaders, right? That's about 100K a year to set up the entire thing, excluding your advertisement spend. Now, then you'll be thinking, Siao Ben, who will do this? Two reasons, right? First, you do it as a team. Number two, your market is high net worth. Because when you close a big case, 50K FYC, 100K FYC for one, it's okay, ma. Right? So that's how you make back, right? So that's that, right? So let's skip that. How many of you, before the appointment, you all send reminder? Three days before, two days before, one day on the actual day, hey, Mr. Prospect, I'm at Starbucks already, you know, can I get a drink for you? Then the MIA. So that's usually, we do reminders, right? What people don't do is pre-frame. People will do reminders, but people will not pre-frame. What do you mean by pre-frame? Very simple. Remember, if you are in the, imagine that you are running ads and doing leads, right? The prospect doesn't know you. Doesn't. And then you expect this person to meet you a bit hard. Even if you are selling freebie, uh, gift box, $5 grab voucher, even if you are doing that, it's very hard for them to show up. So what you do with pre-frame, right, is maybe send a, what we do is we send like pre-frame material decks, so on and so forth. And then we talk about exactly who you are, what you do, why you do, a whole lot of testimonials, what you're going to get out of the session with you, other than the gift voucher, so on and so forth. Right? And we make sure they read it. Right? And then this increases show up rate. Right? So that's basically what we do for show up rate. And for Patrick, right? remember that's not a case study, Patrick? His show up rate was about 30% or so. We got it to 80%. Just using this deck. Right? So that's pre -fake. Right? For all my folks, younger folks who do like social media, like way on the social media, yeah, send your IG biography or something like that also, send. Okay? So that's why I do increase. Now, if you go for first appointment, first appointment, they don't show up for second appointment. Usually the reason is either one of two things. First reason, your first appointment, you already attempted to close. Meaning you say, yeah, cash you up or whatever, right? Straight open up, do some short contact, open up the product, go through the BI, whatever, right? And then say, okay, it's either this option or this option. Then they will tell you, think about it. Then you have no objection, right? Then you say, okay, you know what? Let's set up a next appointment. They don't show up because they know for the very fact that the second appointment, they are going to show up for you to close them. So they most likely won't show up. The trick that we have done, I'm going to say trick, huh? the goal is, right, first appointment, you just do concepts, you give them a rough idea of what they are going to get or what they should get. Then you tell them, hey, you know what, Mr. and Mr. Prospect, but based on now, you know, I can't really recommend you anything. Let me go back, quote unquote, do my homework. Next time we meet, I'll run through exactly so you have a better option, so on and so forth. Right? So that's what we, we split into two appointment clothes, and that's why people show up for the second one. Right? So that's the first reason. Second reason, people don't show up for the next appointment with you because they don't find value. Right? They don't find value. Value in two ways. Either they had a bad experience on the first one, then they don't want to show up on the second one, or they had a good session with you on the first one, but then the second one, yeah, I, meet, I meet you for what? Ah? Right, like, what was this meeting for? That's why they don't show up, right? So these are things that we have to diagnose and fix, right? Then, of course, closing, closing ratio is different by how you close and what's the objection that you, that you do to overcome. Then case size is just cross-set up, self. make sense? These are the exact things. Now, of course, there's a lot of nitty-gritty stuff, right? But big idea, this is exactly what you do for our clients. We look at what's the sales process, what do you do, what's the problem, so on and so forth. Okay, who here find this a bit leche? Oh, a lot of work, huh? Agree? A lot of work, huh? Okay, good. So, hopefully the next few slides will incentivize you to do it better. Just imagine the 10 appointments that you set. Three will show up. So, show up rate is what? 30%, agree? If we want to go from, want to change the show up rate from 30% to 60%, my question to everybody here, why is the percentage increase? The truth, right, is that it's 100% increase. Because if you do the percentage, I'm not going to do the math, lah, okay? But like, you get the point. It's 100% increase. Right? Because you twice. You realize? You see, every 10 appointment is 3, right? Now it's every 10 appointment is 6. Technically, it's twice. So you realize that if, you just, if we just keep 
everything else constant. Everything else. You only change the show up rate. You just break your production. Make sense? Do you realize it's actually that simple? Yes, it's leche. But you think about it. If I just get more people to show up, I don't need to keep buying more leads. I don't need to try to close better. I just need them to show up. And I just flex my production. And you guys can understand, huh? this is only this is only what? This is only one factor. Realize? This is one factor, the reminder and pre -frame. We haven't talked about closing, we haven't talked about the upsides and cross sell of cases. If we do all of that, that's how Literary Pageant went from like 4K to like 10K a month. Because we did all of the things accordingly. So this is how you increase your production without buying more leads. Next time you see my ads. I used to run an advertisement four years ago. And the first line is, hey financial advisors, what if I told you that leads are not the problem? Because everybody always assumes leads is the problem, right? Is it really the problem? For some, yes. And who are the some? Usually if you are foreigner or you are Malaysian PR or something from Singapore, not very long, usually that's a problem. Right, then you'll continue to call so on and so forth. Right, that's usually the case. Okay, so makes sense so far, everybody. Yes, the math. Yes, huh? Okay, so this is how we do it. Now, next thing. Oh, let's do another math. Okay, I guess I'll show you guys. Uh, the math is simple. If you just upsell every single appointment from today onwards, just by 10%, this is what happens. 30k, you earn another 3k more. If you are earning 50k a year, you get another 5k more. 70 to 7k or 100k is 10k. FYC. Excluding all the bonuses, recurring, referrals, and so forth. Make sense? So if you can just upsell, you get more money. Right now, some of you might be 50k range and if 5k, not a lot. But guys, sometimes 5k could be the difference between you going for your achievers or not. Or MDRT or not, agree? Right? So just literally, okay, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you guys, who, who here wants a script that exactly teaches you how to upsell by another 10-15% without more leads? Anyone? No, okay, so only those that raise your hands, then I'll give, okay? So the rest, your wait. Ah, Joe, help me, ah. Huh? Okay, literally, uh, word for word script, uh, training videos, everything else, right? I'll give you guys that, right? So just upsell, because you just increase your production by that, without quote unquote more leads. Right, and this is how we see the business. If every time we keep getting, being told the lie that leads is a problem, we will always think that leads is a problem. But remember what I said just now. Current industry, the problem right now is not a lack of solutions, but a problem with misdiagnosis. So if you diagnose the wrong problem, you keep thinking this is a problem, then this will always be the wrong one. But it's actually other things as well. Okay, so mistakes. Uh, go by fuse having a structure. I mentioned if you go by fuse, how do you know what went well? Right? So for example, you go for very common, go a lot of advisors go for appointment, right? And then they are like, go through the concept, do the closing. And I say, okay, do you have a structure? Do you know exactly what you say, what you ask, so on and so forth, more or less? Uh. Actually, no. Uh. Go by fuse on it. Good. So your next appointment, what are you going to say? I think it'll be different. So what happens is that every appointment you go for, right, more or less different. Then the question right, becomes, even if you can close, how do you know exactly what you say or what you ask that help you lead to the closure? And if you didn't close, how do you know what you say or ask that made you didn't close? So there's a couple of implications. The biggest one right, is that basically, right, for those people who go by fields and still can close, sure have one, you sure have one. Go by fields, can close, right? The impact or the negative consequence of this, right, is that you have this level of uncertainty of not knowing when you go for the next appointment, how is it going to be like? Because the last time you're based on fuse, can close. Now you go based on fuse, it's not cannot. Eh? Is it my fuse wrong? Right, then you think the problem lies with you. So what happens here is that then it's uncertain because you do not know what's the cause and effect of things. The effect is closing. What's the cause? If you don't know what's the cause, uncertain now, of course. Right, what if you got lucky? Okay? So that's that. Ah, so like I mentioned, the reason why you're unable to replicate success and feeling uncertainty because you don't know cause and effect of things. So it's a bit small, but it's the whole idea of you might be working on asking for more referrals, but actually your real problem is conversion. Right? Now, if you guys, it's funny, so with the Patrick case study one, right, the first thing he tell me on the call, right, was I say, hey Patrick, what's the main challenge of your business? Lack of leads. The first damn thing he tell me, lack of leads. And I've been through 1,500 over calls one-on-one, -on -one, right? Most of them will say lack of leads. And, and uh, we didn't even change the... <laughs> I didn't even do anything to the advertisement or cold calling. We didn't even do that. Eh. We just changed the sales because it's a sales process that's involved. He was closing about 15% or 10%. So it wasn't a lot. Case size, because we go, let's say, from shield or cash shield, right? K 
Pizza is kacang putih, ma. Agree? Even you try to cross it after that, not the easiest. Because then you sell already, people will start thinking, oh, you try to sell me other things. Uh. Right? Ah, I see your laugh. Ah, okay, because that's the way it is. So then, how can we change the sale process such that the case size can be bigger? If your cash yield is 200 bucks, if you can just close one more term plan, let's say 1,000 a year. What's the comms on that, guys? In G? 40? 50? 50%? Oh, yeah, depending, right? Depending on maybe whatever, to, to age, renewable, whatever. But let's say it's 50%. You earn another $500 more. So by right, you're supposed to earn $200 FIC, right? Now you close one more term, you earn $500. What happened? Total is 700 eh? You literally just more than triple your production. If you just think about that, right? Okay, so that's basically that, okay? So when you work on the right things at the right time, your efforts will get you exponentially larger results. This is why you call asymmetric. Okay, so that's that, right? And this is what leverage means. Okay, so of course this is Tsuhao, so on and so forth. Ah, okay, it's, the reason I showed Tsuhao, right? Because he's actually, uh, okay, okay, don't, don't, don't worry, ah. Because actually, yeah, actually Tsuhao is a uh, Malaysian PR. I right, was Malaysian, came to Singapore, he's from Penang, and everything else, right? Yeah, first year, seven, eight months in the MDRT. Eh. I think during COVID or something, eight months in the MDRT. Eh. So actually, months I want, I mean, the truth is, it's really not bad, right? Came on a call, the problem was the next year, unable to replicate it, not knowing where the prospect come from, because his warm market supported him, quote unquote support, right? So then we had to work out something, right? So that's for him, and he did his MDRT again, right? So that's for Tsuhao. Eh? Stage four, stage five, in my years of the business, Maybe 10, 15 percent of the people who will be in this stage. So if you are one of them, then uh, kudos to you. Right? It's, a, it's a great place to be. Okay, but also have your own problem. So stage four, your income is 10 to 16 k a month, plus minus. It be 10 to 18 k. Right? Main problem is sustainability. Okay. Main outcome is leverage, and the framework is you need to scale the advisor. Okay. So I'll explain more in a while. Now your situation plus minus uh, you should be maybe 7, 8 k FYC every month. Uh, you know. Your bonuses, whatever, maybe it's like four, six, maybe even eight k a month. Income is about ten to sixteen. Clients, huge range, hundred fifty to five hundred, right? Now, sometimes it could be less than hundred because sometimes the case size is a lot bigger. Like one big case come in, but the one big case coming is also a problem because it's a sustainability problem. You cannot have big case coming in already, right? So it's still a sustainability problem, right? So that's that. Let me just describe the situation a bit. So this is where you probably do about two rounds already, two rounds to COT. You know, uh, have been acquiring clients, and then now you know we have this amount of um, clients or whatever, right? So, oh, here's a big one, right? So at this stage, I find that a lot of advisors at this stage they actually got service their clients, but mainly the servicing a lot of do we cross it up sales. So every year do post review, you know, do a bit of catch up here and there. Not really having a system. One of the key problems also is that because we have so many clients, right? Okay, usually this is where you are about seven, eight, ten years in the business already. Easy. Usually the problem I realize, right, is that first few years is acquire clients, correct? Acquire, acquire, acquire. Then after that, the day which is the industry says that once you have a certain number of clients, then it's go now, right? Then you can just like cross out upsell from there, so on and so forth. That's usually the risk. Any idea what's the magic number? How many clients you need to have such that you don't really need to do roadshow or call anymore? Sorry? 500? 1,000? Yeah, about there, right? Okay, cool. Now, the range is, the range, I was about to say like this, there's like a specific number of plus minus range, but it's so wide because I have a client, which I'll show later, it's about 15 years in business, right? You only have about 200 clients. He does MDR in like three months, four months, five months, kind, right? But you only have, yeah, 180, 200 clients. I have an advisor, same, another person for another company, 900 clients, of which 300 is often, so it's 600, lah, right? Doing cold call. You're thinking why, right? Yeah, the problem is because his existing clients, he already, quote unquote, ah, don't, don't quote me, ah, just quote unquote. Ah. In Chinese, anyone feel it? Right? You keep going back to your, here's the symptom. You go back to existing clients, say, hey, we should do a review, good long time no see, or whatever. Blue tick, or they don't reply you. Right, or even if they meet you already, you also think to yourself, sell also sell finish already. <laughs> ask for referral, also ask finish already. Right? Then how? That's usually where the problem is. Makes sense. Right? So this is where most people are at because once they have the clientele base, right, they're able to sustain their income because they go back to existing clients. The problem is that once you do that for a few years, two, three years usually, 
you start to face this, what, we, what I call, this one can quote me, it's called policy review fatigue. It's called review fatigue because people see an of you going back already. Right? Not that you are doing a bad job. I need to put a highlight this. It's not that we are doing a bad job. It's just that every time they see your name, they associate your name with meet up. Meet up means money out of the pocket. That's literally the association. <laughs> you all laugh ah, because I ah, say the most senior one. Ah, that's ah, you can ask the senior sector because it's true. Right? So that's basically the big problem over here, right? Then of course, like I mentioned, the people who are here is either your high achievers. If you are like here in the first three, four years, or even two years, right, you are considered a quote unquote high achiever. Um, or usually you are longer than business, seven, eight, ten years usually, and above. Okay? So, main problem is sustainability in three areas. Number one, time. Okay? Because you are so packed, right? And then plus, you got family, you got personal stuff, time is packed. Number two, which is something that nobody talks about, is actually energy. Now, we all hear and talk about time management, agree? or manage your time properly, whatever. But who here agrees, huh? 8 a.m. in the morning is different from 8 p.m. at night. Huh? Same time, huh? but energy level different. So then what we really need to care about a lot more is about energy more than just time. Right? Because the problem with time and the concept of time right, is that time is linear. 8 to 9, 9 to 10 is the same one hour. Energy is not linear. And when we try to work and prospect and sell and go for meetings as though we are linear, that's where we have burnout, crash, and feel sad, demoralized. Why am I doing this? Then after that, let's say you're earning 10k, huh? you tell your colleague, oh, I'm very stressed, very burnout. They look at you, you You earn 10k a month, you tell me you burn out. You don't want to do this anymore? You want to go for a three month vacation? I see, think you're crazy. But that's really usually the problem. Make sense? Okay, so time and energy. Okay, last one is method. So method is kind of linked to time and energy. But I just read, um, so for example, if you're on your 12th year, you try to do road shows. Do you agree we have a problem? You got a lot of time, uh, but your energy cannot. Uh, right? That's the truth. You know? So that's usually a problem, right? So something in three areas. So the main outcome, the thing you want to do in this is to gain leverage, right? And leverage is basically get more units of output, right? More than every unit of input, right? So that's usually the case. I can't remember which stoic philosopher said this. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. But basically, he said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Who taught physics? Yes? Yeah, how, how physics works, right? Okay, so that's basically that, right? So you want to have leverage. Now, solution is to scale the advisor. What if I scale the advisor? Now, there are a few areas to scale the advisor, and I'll explain it in the next few minutes. So number one, if you're at this stage, the first thing you must always do is to hire. You must hire. This is the first thing. Now, of course, after you eliminate a ton of things that you, that you waste your time on, for example, like social media, uh, then you start hiring. Okay, because if you pay someone, you see, if you think about it, if you hire a PA or whatever, that you pay, let's say, $15 an hour, just for you to use one hour of social media, then you think we lose money, la. make sense? Right? So you have to eliminate stuff and then make sure you hire. Now, some of us, let's say, this is usually for advisors that are relatively big on social media. This is where usually they will hire like content manager, freelancers, virtual assistants, so on and so forth. Right? Now, I'm not sure how the insurance company rules are, but I don't think you can hire virtual assistants from Philippines to help manage the admin stuff, right? I, I doubt so, la, I doubt so, la, right? Because you need to sign form or whatever, right? So, usually get a personal assistant. Funny story. Every time I talk about hiring someone, those who never hired before get excited. Those who hired before, <sighs> I say, la, right? Then you think that's what I'd rather do it myself. Why? Agree, those who hired before, either you teach them, then they do, they F it up, or then you end up having to settle your head yourself, right? Or number two, huh? they do a good job, then they quit three months later. Because you're paying that $8 an hour. Right? That's usually a problem. Make sense? Okay? So that's a higher. But that's a, that's, but that's a different problem altogether, right? It's a hiring and training problem. But number one is always to make sure you hire. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing is to build a client servicing system. So, going back to the entire idea that in this situation, you have a lot of clients already. Other than the cross set upsell part, right? The next big problem here is that you just imagine that you have 600 clients. First of all, not every one of us can visit these 600, even though we try. What's going to happen is that a lot of those clients, I won't say a lot, but a few of those clients, right, will start to drop out. So what happens is that on your CRM, they are a name and contact to you, but to them, you're not their advisor anymore. Right? Thank you, man. Yeah, she 
validate my point. Uh, okay, so, uh, so that's usually a problem. So when you call them, it's almost as good as they just leave you. Uh, you know, like you got dumb in a sense, uh, right? So that's usually a problem. So what happens, right, is this. So when people have a lot of clients, let's say you measure a bucket of water. There's a hole that starts to leak. Everybody starts thinking, more. Just pour more, pour more, pour more. Uh, remember what's the problem? Time, energy, and method. First, it takes a lot of time and energy. Second, the method, not sustainable, right? So remember just now the advisor, a lot of clients are still doing cold call, more than 10 years business, that's what happened. Because all the clients drop out. So you want to have a client servicing system, right? To make sure that these clients are all handled and maintained well, in terms of the cross-sell upsell, in terms of sales, but more importantly, in terms of relationship, okay? Here's one thing that I think would be helpful uh, that would really for, for people at this stage, right? Which is this. Relationships can go from cold to warm. Everybody agree? Right? Let's say we have partner, spouse, we are strangers first and then, you know, become something warm. Unless they are not strangers. Ah, okay, I don't want to go into that. But that's basically can go cold to warm. Nobody considers the other, or the other side of things. People who are warm can also turn cold. So when we build out from stranger to existing clients, it's warmer, right? Cold client to this. But we don't need, but if we neglect them, their relationship turns cold. Then it's as good as just another name again, you see? So you always make sure that maintenance is always needed. And the problem is that you cannot do it yourself. Lah. Those who try it will die, lah. right? You know, and then have so many catch up, high tea lao every day, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, used, to, I used to tell my clients, I, when I was an advisor, right, I spent about, I go high tilao a month, I think easily like eight to ten times. Yeah, you know, you need to understand, you need to understand. I was a 22 year old with a lot of money, relatively speaking, and I just treat people, you know. But of course, it made an ROI, right? Because when you treat people, then, they, then you ask, hey, by the way, it's been a while since you've done a review. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then that's where you go ahead and wait. That's basically my prospecting method, okay? So instead of paying Facebook to buy a lead, I pay high tilao, right, to, to get a sale, okay, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's that. Now, so the key thing, right? So one of the key things that I talk to our higher tier clients, right? People who are two rounds, COT, so on and so forth, right? I always say that the key thing, right, at the stage of business, right, is that how you see things is more important than what you see. Because when you're more than 10 years in business, right, you can do not you everything see already, right? But it's how you see things that makes a difference. So a very literal example, right, is that if let's say you guys are wearing specs or looking at me and everything else, right? If today I give you sunglasses, you put it on, same image, agree? But the color is tinted. So then it affects how you feel, it affects how you see things, and therefore how you behave. Make sense? Right? So this how you see things, what you want and what you see. So instead of seeing clients as clients, see them as assets. And let me explain that a bit, right? So anyone knows what's the definition of an asset? Okay. Huh? Uh, controversial question. Pro property asset or not? Yes? No? Yes, okay, cool. I'm not here to say whether right or wrong, uh. I'm just asking a question. Uh. Having a car, asset or not? Who thinks that having a car is not an, is, is not an asset? It's a liability. Having a car? Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, see? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so you see, you see uh? Now, okay, I won't go into the deep thing, but if you are an accountant or whatever, right, an asset is also a liability, especially if you look, right, if you see the balance sheet. But anyways, the point is, whether something is an asset or not, depends on this one de definition, which is this. An asset is anything that generates future, in short, cha-ching, money. So a property is an asset if it either goes up in capital appreciation or number two gives you rental. Now, let's talk about car. If you look at the accounting side of things and the Singaporean side of things, right, a car is a liability because you take out I don't know, half a million loan. I don't know the COE now, right? But I know it was 100 over 1,000 at one, one point, right? I wanted to cry. But anyways, a car is only, a li it's only an asset if you use that vehicle to generate more money for you. So you might be thinking, how? Very simple. When I used to have a car, I still have a car, but when I used to have a car as an advisor, right? All I did was like, hey bro, where are you? Oh, you have PwC working, you know, because they're doing internship or whatever. Hey, let's go for lunch, let me pick you up. Mm, you know, then pick up, mm, then okay, eat lunch, dinner, hati lao, hati lao, right? 
Then I come back again, right? They say, hey, bro, yeah, hey, let's, let's catch up soon sometime or whatever it is. Hey, by the way, I know, this is the magic phrase for if you're my client, you all know what. The magic phrase is, by the way, hey, by the way, uh, have you ever considered and whatever, lah, right? Or, hey, by the way, you know, have you gotten your whatever based on what you thought about just now? Hey, no, eh. Hey, if you want to, uh, let's have the next session, let's do it together. Okay, let's schedule again. Uh, then I follow up from there. No? So you see, that got me a conversation, an appointment, and therefore sales. So therefore, that car technically in that term is an asset. Make sense? Right? So, who hired someone before? Like an employee, a PA. Some of you did, right? Question is this, asset or liability? Did, no, 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 no. I agree it's an asset. But based on just not the reaction, it doesn't seem like asset. <laughs> what loud basket? Waste my time. You F it up. Now I need to do it. I need to do damage control, whatever, right? Then you what loud? need to pay you 1,000, 2,000 every month. You know that kind of thinking? Then the money feels like an expense, feels like a liability. Yeah, so again, it really depends on what the employee do, right? But the whole point, whole point is that when you hire, it's supposed to be an asset, because the asset buys you back time. Right? You know, so they can do more. Okay? So that's for clients, right? So basically, we have so many different types of assets that people talk about. But in our line of work, the biggest one we have is clients. Right? So the key thing is you want to take care of these clients, which are assets, generate us more money so that we can put in all the other blue color boxes that we talk about. Make sense? Okay? But if you don't have assets, then if you don't have clients, then you've got problem. Right? Okay? So that's that. Huh? So every client, of course, with more clients, there's four things you can do. Three main things. Huh? Either you cross up, sell, get referrals, or get testimonial. That's usually the three things you care of any single client. That's all. That's all, right? So that's that. So of course, you take care of them well, you increase the production, so on and so forth, right? So that's one way you see it. Now, the key thing is to systemize it. So systemize means what? Every time you close that person, you must know exactly how's the onboarding process like, meaning to say, what's the text message that you send them right after they sign? Do you do policy delivery? If once you deliver a policy already, what do you say or do or ask? Do you have to catch up with them? Do you future pace and pre-frame them that in three weeks' time, you're going to go back to them to talk about other areas of their planning? How many of us actually future pace our clients and say that every quarter, this is what we do? This is how many times you go back, so on and so forth. Those things need to be done. And then you also want to have what? For some of you who got a broadcast list or Telegram channel or something? No? Now, some of you have, right? Yeah, we're going to make sure that how was the cadence of the information? What's the cadence of the content? Right? Because we keep talking about all these things are super, super important. Right? Because if you don't have it, what's going to happen is very simple. Every year, policy review, mooncake, okay, mooncake, right? Chinese New Year, uh, some people pao ang pao, but pao the toto inside one, you know? like pao ang pao, right? Yeah. Then what else? Birthday occasion, right? Oh, once in a blue moon of client appreciation, either by you or by agency. Agree? So that's more or less it, right? you know, but that's not enough, right? So you want to have your own system, systemize it, and you get all of this, okay? So, third solution. You need to amplify prospecting skills. So, at this stage, right, there's only two key things you can work towards, too. Number one, right, is that you want to get CPR referrals. What is CPR? CPR is the same thing, right? Consistent, predictable, reliable. What do I mean by CPR referrals? In my world, there's this thing called active referrals, and then there's passive referrals. Active referral is the take out form on the spot, you give me the name kind. That's active because it's predictable, right? Because every appointment you go for, you can get a certain amount. Passive is the, you can just sit fine. You talk to them, then, hey, by the way, if you have anyone you can refer them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go and think about it. You know, I have, I'll let you know. Then three weeks later, hey, bro, I got a friend that I could recommend, you know, can link up with you. That is considered passive. Right? So passive is good because we all know passive and clients come in, usually closing ratio quite high. Usually can close one. Right? The only problem is that it's not, con it's not consistent, it's not predictable. We don't know when it's going to come in. Right? So that's why I say CPR, right? because you want to get an example. Now, second is passive inquiries. So this is where, right? historically speaking, in this industry, there's only two sources of passive, in passive income. Passive, technically passive income, right? You know, it's just a different source. Either from existing clients or from social media. Either one. Best you can have two, right? So usually when you're at this stage, existing clients usually will give you passive referrals already. The thing that's missing, okay, so usually uh, a few of my clients are not more than 10 years, 15 years in the business. Right? The key thing that's needed for them is social media. The key thing that's needed for them is social media. So if you're at this stage, social media is the game for you. 
Now, if you are thinking, wow, but man, I don't want to put myself out there. I only post my granddaughter, you know. Blah, 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 right? I cannot keep up with the young folks who do content very well. You know, my aesthetic, I don't even know what is Canva, Canva right? Or whatever it is, right? Don't worry. You want to hear this blue ocean, if you are in this stage? Or especially for even my seasoned advisors, this is a blue ocean, 100%. Think about it this way, okay? This is my top secret. Here's the thing, huh? If you are a young advisor right now, when I say young, I'm not talking about years of experience, but maybe you're in your 20s, maybe early 30s. Social media, everybody is using social media, correct? Post a whole lot of things. If you look from an ocean strategy, this is technically a red ocean. Because everybody is using it, everybody is posting. Therefore, to stand out, your quality of the content needs to be better than most. That's if you are you know, in your 20s, 30s. Now, if you are in your late 30s, 40s, or even 50s, Social media is a blue ocean. How, how we know? Very simple. How many of you over here who are colleagues with other people who in their 40s, 50s, 60s, uses social media and post a lot to get customers? How, like often or like very rare? Very rare, right? What does this mean? It means that the people around 40s, 50s, 60s who are prospects don't see these kind of things. So even if you post one thing, Is a big opportunity because they, they never see advisor too deep. Imagine that you start posting about your father, your mother, your family, or whatever it is. You start posting about CPF changes. Recently, got what? Essay, right? Change everything. You start posting about all these things, right? You'll get you way more results as compared to someone who's younger. 100%. Don't, don't, if you guys are looking at me like, really, man? Yeah, I got shocked also. Yeah, I got shocked also. Helping yeah, this guy. Yeah, that's how he did MLT in three months because he just get passive inquiries within like, few weeks, eh? because nobody else does it. Okay, so that's really for number three, right? So this is our Amplify. Now, number four, enhancing sales skill sets. Okay, this is where, ladies and gentlemen, I would recommend, okay, recommend is a strong word. I would suggest, this is where asset planning, big case, closing, that kind of stuff, this is where it comes in. This is where you need it. It's not even a, a good to have, you, this is where you need it. Right? Because remember, sustainability in terms of time and energy matter, correct? So, big case, buys back all your time, buys back energy, right? And you change the method. You don't need to cross that upsell, product bundling, so and so So, estate planning, wheels, right? That's another one, um, so on and so forth. So, that's where people do very well, right? So, mistakes. Okay, this one, sad story, okay? Sad situation. But if you're at this stage, the biggest mistake, right, is you will keep grinding and working hard. What I mean. In human nature, right, if you look at when we first started, right, until 10 over years, right, what has gotten us here is we keep doing. Do, 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 pack the schedule, do as much as possible. But the problem is that once you hit a cap of capacity to work, time and energy, you have to change the, the, the way that you do things. Meaning to say, right, thinking becomes more important than doing. Right? But we always default to doing because doing is something that we're familiar with. But thinking isn't. Right? So that's why when you're going up the level, there's a saying that from our mentors, right? which is at each level that you're going up to, the rules of the game change. The rules of the game change. A simple example would be this. If you're a corporate worker right now, earning 3, 4, 5, 6K, 7K a month, if you want to have more money other than investing whatsoever, right? one of the things that people tend to think is that I need to reduce my expenses. Right? Like, cut expenses, cut, 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 cut. They do it because they cannot increase their income just like that. But when you join in this industry, the rules change. It's not about cutting only. It's about expanding how much income you can earn. Why I say this is because if you are trying to save money, do we agree you need to track, manage, track whatever, and then reduce the expense? Time and energy, correct? Why don't you put the same time and energy to earning one more case, one more shield, one more life plan? You say, wow, effort. That's the truth, right? So the rules of the game change. And if we don't adapt and adopt to the rules, we always get stuck. So at this level, right, it's not about doing anymore, it's about thinking and strategizing, right? So that's that. Okay, so usually lead to burnout, end up taking a sabbatical. Ah, this one, interesting. I have this, uh, let's just call him an acquaintance. He's a director, does his own sales, small team, uh, does TOT, right? He did TOT that year, and we were having a chat. And I was like, hey bro, so what are you going to do next year, right? Are you going to do TOT again, yada, yada? And then he just looked at me and he said like, maybe, right? And during the conversation, right, one, this exact same problem happened, which is he was working and grinding a lot. Second, right, his existing clients dried up. 
because in the attempt to hit the COT, he whacked everything. He's about 18 years in the business, right? 40 plus ex army regular, something like that, right? So that's that. Come the next year, text him. What's up, man? How are you? Blah, blah, blah. So how? You know, this year you're running for whatever. Make a guess, what was his reply? Anyone? Yeah, he was taking a sabbatical, right? And, and re-strategize because he ran out of people to sell. That makes sense. So this is where the problem lies, okay? So that's a mistake. Number one, doing of thinking, like I mentioned, right? What got you here won't get you there, okay? So that's kind of things. Okay, now, at this stage, this is one of the key, so simple, um, but so profound. Now, anyone want to fill in the blanks? This is a what business? Generally speaking, people will just say like it's a people business, right? You know, talk to people, blah, blah, blah. Now, if this is a people business, the problem at this stage, right, is that most people flip it the other way around. Their methods are businesses than people. Right? So you think about it. What is, bus what is business first than people? You should really go and ask. That's why Project 100 doesn't work out well for too long. Because you keep going to talk about business first. Can I get something? Can I ask something? Can you give me something? Then you care about the relationship. If this person buy, give you chance, ah, then you can friend, friend. This person say, no, thank you, ah, F you, ah, then after you, off. <laughs> Follow up three years later, right? So this is where business comes from, then people, this is an example of it, right? Same thing, existing clients, businesses, but every year keep doing positive review, right? When's the last time you actually catch up without talking about business? Right, when I talk about this, the silence. And the reason for this, right, why people can't seem to overcome this is because when you go for catch-ups with people, the thing in our mind, the question in our mind is that, what's the instant ROI of this? You catch up with someone, you might not lead to a sale, agree? So you ask yourself, catch up for what? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, correct. So you catch up, we put the people, so you need to understand, right? When we say it's a people business, right? You need to understand, there are two words. There's people and then there's business. There are some advisors only care about people. Every day will talk, go drinking, go whatever. End, up, end of the month, sales goes on. Right? They are also, the other hand, have people, uh, have the business portion, earn money, but then every day feel very sian, no? just feel like, wow, everything I go for is just for appointment, just for money, just to hit awards. At some point in time, you get kind of like, grind, you just kind of bored of it, right? So my point is, when you have people business, you want to have both. Care about the people first, and ask for the business. Don't only do either one. A lot of people get the idea that, oh Ben, what you're advocating is just build relationship. Right? Cannot be, right? No, put the relationship first, then you go for the ask. Because when it comes to business, business needs to be transactional. You give me money, I give you a service or product, agree? But this is a what business? It's a people business. So the people needs to be there. That makes sense. We are not doing e-commerce, eh? but drop shipping, uh, what Shopify, no, you're not doing that. Eh? It's not people, eh? make sense? Okay, so that's that. Huh? Okay, so that's for Banco, right? Oh, it's 15 years business. Now, stage five, last one, everybody happy? Yeah, you're happy because we are progressing or happy because I can finish talking? <laughs> Got a difference, huh? Okay, cool. So hopefully it's because we are progressing, okay? Last one. Uh, this one, very rare. Very, very rare. TOT is top how many percent? Top one? Top one? Five? Huh? One, huh? Yeah, top one percent, right? Yeah. Okay, so. Now, this one, this model stage, huh, exclude if you do Okay, I won't say as good. Uh. This stage uh, is a bit, I was about to say a bit grey, uh. that's not a correct word. A bit like general, meaning to say right, that you can do so many things, right? but there's a few key frameworks. So stage five, right, you're earning 16 to anywhere 50k a month. Right? If you're thinking who earns 50k a month, ask those people who do overseas market. <laughs> right? One year, five million premium. You know, anyone? Do you, do you have? Right, big case, uh, have, right? Sure have, right? You know, the main problem is technician. And usually, right? And then the main outcome is to be a business. You know, you have to see it that way. So, I mentioned FYC, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so usually, uh, a lot of years in the business, unless, again, you're up and rising, you exhausted a lot of ways to generate more production, um, and you just basically hit a ceiling. That's the summary of it. Now, word of mouth here is very important. Like, word of mouth here is very important at this stage. You need people to actively be your quote unquote. Uh, we, our term is called COI, right? You need people, you need to have COIs planted. Right? So what is COI? The way I look at COI is very simple. A COI is like your recruit, but not INF. Agree? Right? This person will go and prospect for you, right? Advocate, right? Also get a certain 
amount of money, so on and so forth. You need a lot of this, right? If not, you or the next thing that most people do with mobile management, right? Mobile management, then you have a lot of COIs, right? Okay, so now the funny thing is, right, at this stage, right, it's only two things. First, you need to close bigger cases. Number two, your biggest value, right, is not closing small plans anymore. So that's where like the game changes, right? And you realize the third point, it goes into specialization. Now I have a friend who did almost TOT, specially uh, specialized in investments. Some of you might know him. Uh, he got a website. It's called Money Maverick. Anyone here? You know? No. No. Okay. Cool. His name is called Luke, right? So basically, only do investments. Only, right? Small, big, everything also take, right? So that's for specialization, right? Main problem is stagnation. Uh, main outcome is build a business, right? So you need to retain and keeping clients. So at this stage, right, it's no longer hiring PA only. You need to hire para planners. Must have. Right? So for who here, okay, who here is a producer slash achiever, like producing, and don't want to go to management? Don't want. Don't, don't want to raise your hand if you don't want to go to management. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so if you don't go to management, everybody thinks uh, go to management means build team, correct not? Uh, then you take care of the Xiao Gua and then they come and cry to you and then you know. <laughs> Right, okay, but you guys, I mean, I've been through a management, right? we all know how it is when it first started, right? But when you are at this stage as a producer, the quote unquote team you want to quote unquote recruit, right, are advisors or like are people that do not want to grow their own team. And the relationship is like an apprenticeship. You know, like you master disciple, that kind of thing. Like you are, you are the person that runs a lot of the clients, and you're someone that wants to just learn all the craft, that kind. Yeah, you, you usually have two. Then usually that's where like you can run about eight hundred to a thousand clients. Yeah, that's usually the way it is, right? So that's that. Oh, modernized marketing and sales system. This is where you need to do a ton of things uh, for people at this stage. You go start doing webinar, seminars, right? Referrals, social media is a big one, and social media you build brand as opposed to getting passive inquiries. So do website lah, this and that lah, blah blah blah. Now finally, in the next one, okay, the next one right is. Remember just now I say. You can hire one of my friends, you pay him 100,000 to build a funnel and then run ads. This is the stage. This is the stage. Because this first, it makes sense because you need bigger cases. Number two, you are buying back time and energy. Number three, yeah, you got money to pay, right? <laughs> and you got the skills to close. You know? So that's basically where it is. Okay? Uh, number three, move up market, like I mentioned already, uh, or <laughs> move up management. Uh. Yeah, that's usually where the case is. Okay, so that's kind of like the big idea here. Okay, now the mistake here is keeping a small pie versus expanding the pie. What do I mean? So, because remember, uh, when we first started this business, yeah, 10, 15, 20 years business, it's technically solo, ma. it's all us. Ma. And then when you want to expand the pie, right, you need to pay people. You need to give away certain part of your money. So your 15K or 20K every month is not purely personal, right? It's quote unquote business expense. People are not willing to do that. And therefore, as a result, the thinking is, if I'm going to pay this person 3K a month, technically this 3K I might as well keep. Then I can do ABC. The alternative of that is that you end up dying try, dying, dying to try, right? Because you keep burning out, you know? So that's really the big uh, mistake over here. Okay, so in summary, we figure out the five stages, right? Stage one is about figuring things out where your income is 0 to 3,000, main problem is acquisition, build sales habit, and the framework is conversation, ask 100. Okay, so if you are a leader here, these are the stages that you can uh, share with your team as well and, and identify for them. Stage two, finding optimal selling system. 3 to 8K, main problem is CPR. The biggest framework you need to have and remember is one times one times one. I focus a lot more time on stage two because this is where most people are at or want to be at also. Right? Now the truth is, not everybody wants to go to stage four or five. Some of us, depending on life stages, are happy with 10 a, 10 a month, eight a month, spending time with kids, so on and so forth. Right? And I think in the light of that, Life is not only about earning money, accolades, and hitting awards. IDA, MDR, TCOT. I think it's about living a fulfilling life as well. Right? So by sharing all this, I don't mean to say that you must follow these stages, but rather you can stop at the stage that you want and get it and live your life. Right? So stage three, rolling the snowball, right? 8 to 10K, efficiency and effectiveness. This is the one that nobody likes. Huh? That's why not a lot of people there. Huh? Agree? Right? Because you need to do the tracking management and everything, right? Number four, create a reoccurring system, 10 to 6K, sustainability, leverage, scaling the advisor. So one big point I forget to mention just now is this. In this stage, we talk about all the system stuff, like hire people, yada yada. Why I say scaling the advisor is because the business or your production can never outgrow yourself. It can never outgrow yourself. 
So if you choose to think in a certain manner, your production or output will be in that certain manner also. Right? So there's a saying that one of my mentors tell me, and I, I love it a lot, which is, we set goals not because of the goal that we can achieve, but because of the person that we become. Right? Why do we set more goals? Why do we set a higher one, one after another? Because we want to develop ourselves to becoming that kind of person. Sadly, in this day and age, in some of these industries, like I said, I've spoken to so many people, advisors, right? A week, we get about, I, I do about 15 to 18 different advisors and leaders call, right? Sadly, there are some people who are MDRT, but not MDRT individual. Meaning, say, got a what? Mayo Leo, no substance. Some of you know what I'm trying to say. You talk to them, you're like, ah, this person MDRT. Yeah. You're also like question mark, right? I say laughing, okay? So, you guys know what I mean, right? So, that's that, nah? okay? Then stage five, renovate and repeat. Okay, so basically, guys, this is the roadmap that you can follow from where you are right now to 30, 40, 50k plus a month.